How's everybody doing today? Good? Good. Well, we're so glad that you decided to join us today, especially if you're watching online. We're so grateful that you decided to check us out. Uh, we know that you have many opportunities and different websites you can visit, but we're glad you visited ours. Amen, everyone? Amen. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, open them up to James uh, chapter 4. We're going to get there in just a few minutes. Um, and I want you to be ready. <clears throat> there we go. There's the book of James. All right. <clears throat> what I want to talk to you today about is this. Four little words, okay? The interesting thing about God's Word is that, is that it's very powerful. Amen? Right? It can change our very lives. And it doesn't have to take a whole bunch of sentences, sometimes in four words. And James is going to give us four words that I believe that will transform our life. But before I get to those four little words, I want to show you three special words. And that's this. Charlotte Avery McAllister. Ben McAllister, our youth, our young adults pastor, had a baby with uh, Annie. And so we just congratulate. Is he here right now? I don't know. Oh, he's right back there. So we're so happy for you. We are so happy for you. So if I was to ask you, I have to go back to this one right here. If I was to ask you, um, in terms of like, your hopes and dreams. It's, it's COVID time. Do we still have hopes and dreams? Amen? <laughs> right? Sometimes it doesn't feel like we have hopes and dreams. But if we had our hopes and dreams, I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about the hopes and dreams that you have for you and for your children, for your family. Are God's fingerprints on them? I want you to think about that. Are God's fingerprints on them? Is, is he blessing them? Does he know about them? Have you shared them with him? Uh, ha, has he given them to you? Are his fingerprints on your hopes and dreams. I remember one time, um, right there, look at that. Gorgeous car, right? Hey Amen, gorgeous car. This was my hope and dream in uh, 1993. The 1993 Geostorm, I gave you some uh, facts about this in case you want to buy one one day, because right now the current price is uh, $2,200. But I remember when I was about 18, 19, 20, or maybe about 18, I just graduated school. I wanted this car. I went to um, Market Mall, and they had a Chevy dealership. I think it was a Chevy dealership. And they had all these cars. And I didn't know when I woke up that my passion would be the 1993 Geo Storm. But when I got to that mall parking lot, I'm like, oh, man, I need this. This is my hope, and this is my dream. And I remember, like, you know, talking to the guy about it, and he was telling me, he said, can't you see yourself in the driver's seat? And I'm like, I can see myself in the driver's seat. I totally can see myself in that driver's seat. 95 horsepower. Can I get an amen? Don't amen that. Just kidding. Don't amen that. If you have it, that's great. I was a very impulsive shopper. I sort of still am. I remember thinking I could be in that in that car. You know what? I can make all my friends envious. I can promise people rides to church. Oh, look, now the Lord can use this. Surely he is for me in getting this. But uh, my finances were not for me. Can I get an amen? My finances at 18 were not for me. And I remember getting excited about it and trying to get the application. It wasn't happening. They said, no, you can't afford this. And I'm asking all my, my family members, will you sign? Will you co-sign? Will you co-sign? And wisely they said no. Wisely they said no. But I remember thinking about how I wanted this so badly. And looking back on my life, and I sort of shared this story with you before. I believe that God had more important things for me than this 1993 Geostorm. And if I had spent the $11,000 on it, I may not have gone on. I may have been straddled or whatever with this debt. I may not have gone to Vanguard College. I may not have met my wife. I may not have the two great kids that I have today. Amen. And so there are times in our lives where we have to ask, Lord, are your fingerprints on the decisions that I'm making? I desperately need your fingerprints to be on the decisions that I'm making. Because some of the decisions that we're making are important. Like most of them. We want to live for the Lord. Amen? We want to live for the Lord. I could have missed out. And there's this great scripture that maybe a lot of us are familiar with. Maybe some of you aren't. That says this in Jeremiah 17, 9. And I think about this scripture a lot. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Ouch. <laughs> And beyond cure, who can understand it? The heart is deceptive above all things. And there are times in our lives where we can't fully trust the desires of our heart. There are times that in maybe our brokenness or impulsiveness or we see the, the most beautiful blue color imaginable on planet Earth. And we're like, I got to get that. And it clouds our judgment. And our heart wants what it wants, but it's not necessarily what God wants for us. And so this is what James is going to help us to try to understand is, is these desires of our hearts, the plans that we have, are the Lord a part of those plans? And I hope that they are. We are in a series in James right now. So for those of you who haven't been here for a while, I'll get you up to speed here. 
The first one that we talked about was listening and doing. It says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. The book of, of James is an action-oriented book, right? It's, it's, let's do something. The second one, <clears throat> sermon that we talked about was favoritism forbidden. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. So, you know, for, don't just like, oh, because you're rich and I might get something from you, I'm going to be your friend, right? Remember that, 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 that sermon, right? But that we are all to love everyone and not just because we can get something out of our relationships. Our relationships are not commercial in that way. It goes on. We had another sermon where we talked about faith and deeds. In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. That, yes, I see your faith, but I want to see those actions. They don't save us. But we need to have actions alongside our faith. Then, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about taming the tongue. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire but a small spark. And how many times in your life have you burned something down because you said something you shouldn't have? And there are times where we say things that we shouldn't say. And we make boasts that we shouldn't boast. If we're going to boast, we're going to boast in the Lord. And then lastly, <clears throat> submit yourselves. This is what Pastor Norell talked about last week. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will, free from, or he will free from you. <laughs> he will flee from you. And this is what I love about James. And I want you to say this with me. Hard truths, soft hearts. Sometimes hard truths can create soft hearts. And soft hearts submitted to the will of God, great things can happen. Amen? So, Lord, in this few moments that we have together, as we read your word, I pray by your spirit, you would help us to understand. That, Lord, maybe for a lot of us, this will be a reminder of what we already knew. But maybe we weren't fully practicing it. Maybe we got caught up in the 1993 geostorms of our lives. Or we we were swept away by something that we didn't really even throw it out to you as, is this your will? Is this something that you want for us? And so, Lord, I just pray by your grace and by your mercy, Lord, help us, correct us, lead us um, as we just continually seek to follow after your will all the days of our lives. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. All right. So if you have your Bibles, James 4.13 says this. It says this. <clears throat> Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, and we will spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet, You do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Today or tomorrow, we're going to go do this. We're going to to go and we're going to invest. We're going to make some money. We're going to make profit. We're going to do this. And yet he says what? You don't even know what tomorrow will bring. You're you're making a declaration about something that's going to happen a year from now when sometimes we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Amen? And so this is what, this is what uh, James is helping us understand. And when we first read this, when I first read this, the first thing that we might say is, this sounds like all of us. I didn't know this was totally wrong to do, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, we have to make plans, right? We have, we have to pay our mortgage. We have careers that, you know, we've got family to raise and all of these kinds of things. But I think what James is saying is that planning isn't wrong. The Bible is full of, of people called to be good stewards and for us to count the cost. He's referring to this heart attitude of who is in control of your life. Who is in control of your life? How are your steps being ordered, by you or by God? And he's talking with these merchants and traders that there is a sin of presumption that we know what we can do, and we know how to get there, and we know what the results will be. But James says this. He says, first of all, you are a mist, right? You are not as here as long as you think you'll be, right? You're here for a season. And I'm not trying to get too morbid, but you know what? When you, when you feel like you might be, you've lived longer <laughs> than you will continue to live, you know what I mean when I say that, right? Like you, can, you start to understand this a lot more. Like my kids, or if you have young kids, they're not thinking about, I wonder how long I have to live, right? 70 or 80 years if the Lord gives me strength. But as you get older, and all of a sudden, you know, you're like, oh, I got to get these reading glasses. Amen? Reading glasses? Amen? You're like, what happened to the warranty on my body, Lord? <laughs> Can we get it extended? You know, all of a sudden you get a, a weird pain, or you start yelling out more often, where's the low-dose aspirin, honey? You know, those kinds of things, right? You start to realize that we are amiss, that we're not here forever. We are eternal. We will be with the Lord. But our time here, we don't know how long we have. We are a mist. 
that we can't control the outcome, where they said, we will make a profit. It's guaranteed. This is what we will do. But we, sometimes we just cannot control the outcomes in our life. As hard as we want to, as hard as we want to, and as maybe as much as we try to force um, our will upon our circumstances, that it doesn't always happen that way. And then lastly, he says this, is that, <clears throat> that, you, that you don't know the future. You know, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. And when we look back at our own lives, I'm sure this is very apparent. Are there, are there times in your life when, if you were to look back right now, you know, like if you look back in the past, and there are things that surprised you what you did. I never knew I would do this or marry that person or live in this place. And, and you're surprised, and hopefully they are good surprises. <clears throat> but we just don't know. I didn't realize that I would be working at this church for 16, 17 years of my life. I never planned that, but I'm thankful that the Lord has allowed me to do that. But it's just to say that I don't know what the future holds. But I believe that God does. And what James is trying to tell us is, is that you, you can't just make these kinds of presumptions in your life. And it's easy to do, but Proverbs 27, 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you, don't know, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And so here's this, this statement that James makes. That yes, I know that you think that, you know, you understand today and you're going to go do this. You're going to go plan and you're going to make this profit. You understand your future hope. But there's a part that's missing. There's a part that's missing in your plan and that's God. That's God. <clears throat> Nowhere does it talk about, what, Lord, what do you think I should do? And so when we think about what he says here in scripture, he says this um, in James. He says, what is your life? For you are a miss. That's a great question. What is your life? What is your life? What are the hopes and dreams that you have? And are God's fingerprints on them? There are times when we will have to make practical decisions about our education, about a career move, uh, maybe actually moving, going from one place to another, or maybe one continent to another, like some of you have done, making investments and what we should spend and how much we should spend it on. And should we buy a beautiful blue 1993 Geo Metro? No, not Geo Metro, Geo Storm, yeah. But in those decisions, which are large, but also even small, is God a part of that? Are we, are we inviting God into those scenarios? Because when it comes to COVID right now, there's an interesting dynamic that I feel. That because of COVID-19, it sort of it hit us really hard. And, and the image that I had, and I, I shared this one time um, during, um, just when I was up here praying, and, you know, during one of the services. That it was almost like there's like this uh, traffic light. That when COVID hit, it's like the red light turned on. And we all had to stop. We all had to shelter in place and hopefully find toilet paper, right? But then all of a sudden, it's not fully green. It's sort of yellow. It's like, go if it's safe. And some of us have gone and some of us haven't. And I'm not just talking about coming to church, but I'm just saying in life. Some of us have, have taken the bull by the horns and we're like, we're doing it. You know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not waiting for anything. I'm going to power up. I'm going to put my ducks in a row. And I'm going to safeguard myself from pain. I'm going to make sure that COVID doesn't affect me at all. The flip side is, is that all of a sudden we have maybe this laxical, daisical, que sort of attitude about life where we're like, well, whatever will be, will be. And both of those, <clears throat> upon careful reflection, can still exhibit the same heart condition, which is a self-reliant heart that says, I'm still in charge. Whether I'm going to do nothing or I'm going to do everything and I'm going to circle my wagon, I'm going to make sure that I'm taken care of. At times, if we're not careful, we could not require God's intervention or even seek it and, and not even realize it. As Scripture says in Proverbs 16, 9, says this. Oh, here's some pictures. What is your life? In a heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Amen? A man's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand his own way? That, that God has to be in the middle of this, in the center of our decisions, both large and small. And it's very important because then James goes on to say, I want you to understand this as it is. You boast in your arrogance. <clears throat> Talking to these traitors. That you're boasting in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Now, if we boast in the Lord, that's not evil. But when we boast in our own self and our own accomplishments and our own, you know, we can do it without God. Then yeah, that is. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do, and he doesn't do it, sins. And so when you think about our lives, sometimes it's actually quite easy 
to slip into this boasting about tomorrow or not relying on God for a couple reasons, but the ones that, that I have, and you may have more, is that we're actually good at making profit. The Lord has allowed us this free will, right? So we get up in the morning. We know, how to, we know the techniques of life. We know how to feed ourselves. We know how to get our job done. We know how to find enjoyment. There's a lot of things that we can do autonomously. We can, we can go do these things. We're, we're sort of wired that way. <clears throat> but that's not what God's intent is for us. But we know how to do it. There's many people that are successful that live without God. And they do it every day. The second thing that I think that makes boasting about tomorrow kind of easy is that sometimes tomorrow looks a lot like yesterday. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when you look at your life, sometimes what we want is we want adventure but not danger. So we sort of try to do our best to, to, to shield ourselves from the pains and anxieties of life. And I don't you know, think that's a bad thing. I can understand why we would do it. But, but we find this, when we're in charge, we find this sweet spot. We want to stay there. There's no adventure. Tomorrow looks a lot like yesterday. And we get in this rut, and sometimes we don't need to call on God because we're not in danger. There's, there's, no, there's hardly any adventure in our life that says, help me, Lord, help me. And yet when you see the, the scriptures of people in the book of Acts and in the Old Testament that, are just, that were living out these adventures, these faith adventures, they needed desperately to cry out on God, for God. There's times where when you started a new job, where it is like, I need you, Lord, I need you. I don't know what I'm doing. Help me, Lord. I'm going to get fired if you don't want to help me. And then once we got the rhythms, we know what we're doing. All of a sudden, we're like, I got it from here, Lord. I got it from here. But I think the real reason that we boast is probably one of these things. This is this sense of fear, this envy, this pride or insecurity. There are times in our life where we, we just we boast because we're afraid. They're, you know, oh, this person is bigger or stronger than me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to power up and I'm going to let them know not to mess with me. Because we are afraid. We're afraid of what's going to happen, so we boom, we, we power up. Maybe other people have things that we want and we envy. So we tend to hype up the things that we have. You know, oh, that's a really nice, oh, that's the base model. That's the base model. That's nice. Oh, look what I've got, right? Or pride. We can't stand others feeling superior over us, and so we try to be superior over to them. You know, like, I don't know your family dynamics, and I'm an only child, so I don't have this problem. But competing with a sibling... Okay, I don't know if any of you have that issue. You know, where, where you guys sit at the Christmas table or the Thanksgiving table and you start discussing how much money you have and how successful you are and all of these things and all how well-behaved your kids are. And then you start, I just need to boast. I need to brag. I need to, I need to let them know how great I am. And this pride kicks in. Or lastly, just insecurity. Is we look for the things that we do to give us value rather than God. And so we are constantly in a state of trying to tell people why we should be loved and why we uh, should, should be accepted and why we should be needed. Ironically enough, I felt the Lord say this to me uh, yesterday. Ironically enough, boasting largely comes not out of our abundance but out of our lack. We usually boast about our abundance and how great we are, but largely it shows a lack in our own lives. And when we are at our workplace or in our schools or wherever we find ourselves and we hear people boasting all the time, it's probably because of there is an insecurity that's bubbling up. And if the tension or the temptation for us is that I'm going to power up as well and I'm going to boast back, we ought not to do that. We ought to show grace and mercy because maybe something is going on in their lives that God is trying to expose and help you to be a part of it. And so James is this, is this letter of action. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. That's a phenomenal statement. Remember how when you also, you just had to worry about the sins that you were committing, right? The sins of commission. Now we've got these sins of omission, the ones that we haven't done. Because we just are in action. And the reason I think that James tells us this is because our boasting largely can lead to just talk and no action. It is boasting and bragging in this braggadocious way, and we're saying all this stuff, but we're not doing much about it. And James wants us to, you know, if, 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 if you know the good you ought to do and you don't do it, it's sin for you. There are some of us in this room right now, and maybe watching online, that you are called to forgive someone, but you are not doing it. And you know you should be doing it. And the Lord is nagging you to do it and constantly, like, trust me in this. You need to do this. Well, they, will, they started it. They started it. Just trust in the Lord. For us to maybe seek justice or show compassion, especially at this time. It's like those, those food hampers are a great way, right, to just let our love and our deeds be, be one. Those hampers that we've got. Maybe to share God's blessing. Proverbs 3 says this. 
It says this, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow when you now have it with you. Powerful verse. But the Lord has blessed us, and, 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 and as we are able to, out of the abundance of what God has given us to give back, to be people of action. This is the good we ought to do. Or to trust in God. Hebrews 11, 8 says this. I love this. By faith, Abraham, when he, called, um, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. That's crazy. Most of us need a detailed schedule and the packing list and who's paying for this before we leave. But Abraham, let's do it. I don't even know where I'm going, but I trust you, Lord, to get me there. I trust you, Lord, to get me there. So the solution to all of this, the boasting and bragging and, and, and I don't need God, James says this. James says, and said, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Very simple. To add that prefix to the hopes and dreams, to the fears and concerns that we have in our life, that we consistently say, if the Lord wills. Paul, I mean, there have numerous examples, but just in Acts and 1 Corinthians where he says, I will return to you if God wills. Uh, I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. If the Lord permits, I hope to spend time with you. That people like, like Paul understood this. That, Lord, I, I, I'm going to deny myself, pick up my cross, and follow after you. If I'm going to follow after you, then I have to make sure that in my vocabulary there is, if the Lord wills. <clears throat> so the thought experiment would be for you. How would your life change if when you were thinking about your hopes and dreams, your fears and anxieties, it prefaced it with, if the Lord wills? If the Lord wills, Lord, what is it that, you know, whatever might be in your heart for your kids. Like, and I could only imagine that Ben and Annie, as uh, Charlotte was born, <laughs> if the Lord wills, right? We want your blessing on our child. We want your will to be done in our child's life. No, when we say these things, what I'm not saying is, is that, is that we just use it flippantly or cliche, right? Like, if the Lord wills. I'll have a McDouble in the McDonald's drive through right? And then you hope that you get it or you don't. Who knows, right, if the Lord wills. That's not what I'm saying because we don't, want, we don't want what we're saying to just be cliche. Cliche, as someone once said to me, is truth you don't have to think about, right? And we want to be thinking about this. We want your will to be done. Or what it isn't is, is we hope that the Lord won't do it, but we'll say it, right? Like, well, hey, can you help me move? If the Lord wills, I'll be there, <laughs> But I have no desire to be there at all. And in fact, unless the Lord somehow sets an alarm for me, uh, I probably won't be getting up to help, right? If you know the good you ought to do, okay? But these simple four little words to any large decision we make may change the course of your life. Because it's showing, you, it's showing to God that this is what you want for your life, is you want his will to be done. And if we actually say, if the Lord wills be done in our life, a few things will happen. I believe, first of all, it will encourage us to see God both in the good times and the bad times. Because there are times when things are going bad that we are definitely, God, put your fingerprints on all of my prayers right now. Please hear me. Please hear me. I desperately need you. But when things are going fine, we're like, I got it. I'm okay. You help somebody else out. When the Lord wants to be a part of our lives, and we want the Lord to be a part of our life, and just because we're saying if the Lord wills, I'm not saying that it's going to be perfect and easy. But what it is, is it's, he's going to take us to the place where we need to be. And we want to have hearts that cultivate that. So, number one, it encourages us to seek God in both the good times and the bad. The second thing it does is it forces us to ask, would this be God's will? There are times that we just do things without even thinking. And wondering, does God like this or not like this, right? So, for instance, if I said, if the Lord wills, I will embezzle from my company. Do you think I would stop and say, I, maybe the Lord won't. <laughs> maybe that's not the Lord's will. If the Lord wills, I will never forgive you or speak to you again. I don't know. We would say these things. I hope none of us would say these things here. But, but as human beings, we will. I'll never forgive you or speak to you again. But then we say, is that what the Lord would want? Was that, would that be what the Lord would want? And it starts to check our heart. And it starts to check our motive. And check our desires. So that the third thing is that then we will start to see this exchange of will. 
from, from just what we want to what he wants. That when we continually say these things, as James encourages us to do, that you're going to make these plans, you're going to go do these things, you're going to go do those things, but say this thing first, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills. Because I believe that the goal of our faith is to say, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Not my will. In fact, the Matthew 6 to 10, or Matthew 6 to 10, rather, the Lord's Prayer says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's our desire. It should be our desire. It's not always, but Lord, give us the grace to make it more of our desire to see your desire. To see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in fact, Jesus doesn't just say this and then say, well, hey, I'm God's son. I don't need to do this, but you guys should do this. He does it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he says this in Matthew 26, 39. And most of us are familiar. Going a little farther, he fell on his face. He's about to go to the cross. And he, and he fell to the ground and, and he prayed this. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will but as you will. And so if <laughs> our Lord and Savior practices this, we ought to as well. In fact, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord and with all of your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways, in all your ways acknowledge him, right? I'm acknowledging you, Lord. I'm acknowledging you. Help me, lead me. Um, there's gonna be times where you need to make decisions, obviously. Chicken or fish. I mean, you could probably make those decisions. But there are going to be times where we desperately want to cultivate a heart's sensitivity to if the Lord wills. If the Lord wills. Because I want your will. And so James says this. He says, I know that, you know, you're going to go here. You're going to make these plans. You're going to try to make your life better. I understand that. That's what we do. That's what human beings do. But instead of saying today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit, he says, if the Lord wills. Say that. Four little words. We will live and do this or that. And the thing is, is that our actions may not change. We may still be doing the same things that we were hoping to do. But now it gives room for obedience in in our heart. It gives gives the will of God room to move in our lives. So we're not just making decisions on our own and trusting, you know, post that the Lord is sort of blessing them. In fact, this is sort of the prayer that maybe we could pray. Because this would be something that I would pray, Lord... I am finite, and your ways are higher than ours, and I need to make this decision, but I'm not sure which one to make. And I believe this is your will, and if so, Lord, let it come to pass. But if not, I ask you to make your will known, because my desire is that whatever decision is made, that it lines up to your will. That would be our prayer, followers of Jesus. And this is what I think James is trying to help us understand, that this is the prayer that sort of is the antidote to our own self-sufficiency. And it's easy in this world, and at times it's really easy, to just continually be self-sufficient. And if we were to look back on the days, weeks, months, and even years of our lives, how many times have we really called upon the Lord? Say, Lord, is this your will? And this is, there's no judgment here. I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious when I say this. I don't want people to feel, you know, oh, because there's just no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. But for some of us, we've, we started out on this journey saying, Lord, yes, whatever it is, your will, I, 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 I'm dead to self. And then sometimes we slide off the altar. We come off the altar. And we try to just, we live on our own power. And I don't think that's what the Lord's will. I'm going to ask Mark to come on up. And so when we make this prayer, we would say, Lord, this is your company, if it be your will. Whatever it is that you need. This is, this is your church, Lord. We say this all the time. Lord, this is the Lord's church. This is Mark's church, board's church. It's the Lord's church. Let it be your will. And, and my life is not even my own. It's yours. Because of your, your death and your resurrection and your sacrifice, I have new life. And I want to deny myself, Lord, and pick up my cross and follow after you. And so, Lord, I thank you for today. And I thank you, Lord, for the word that is in the book of James. That we would pray <laughs> if the Lord wills. And maybe for some of us, Lord, a lot of it is it's my will. And it's my decision, and these are my hopes, and these are my dreams. But I pray, Lord, that just as we just enter back into a time of worship, that, Lord, that you would soften our heart. This is a hard truth because it's it's, it's hard to live out. (laughs) But, Lord, your grace is sufficient for us to do it. Your grace and your mercy are sufficient for us by your spirit to empower us to, to, to live more humbly, to not boast in our own strength, boast in our own wealth, 
boast in our own education or whatever it might be, but it is to boast in you. And so, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your grace. I pray this in Jesus' name. I'm going to invite you to stand. Let's worship the Lord, and then I'll come back and close. mind just let's uh, bow our heads and close our eyes and if you're watching at home we're just going to lead you in a prayer and if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior then maybe you've never said if the Lord wills it's only been your will then today could be a great day for you to just (laughs) deny yourself to pick up your cross and to follow after Jesus I'm going to pray this prayer and if that's you today then you can just pray along with me Lord it's my desire that that your will, um, that I would do your will. Lord, I confess that I've tried to live a life on my own and it's led into brokenness and hardship, struggle, anxiety. I feel far away from you. My sin has separated me from you. But because of what your son has done for me on the cross, I can have new life, new hope, new joy, that my sins can be removed and I can experience all the things that you have for me. And the thing that I really need is to see your will be done in my life. Your kingdom come and your will be done in my life. And so I surrender my life to you. I surrender my heart. I surrender my will, my decisions, and ask that from this day forward, you would lead me and that you would guide me. And that that prayer would be constantly on my lips if the Lord wills. And Lord, for everyone else in this room that's already accepted Jesus, or if you're watching online and you've accepted Christ, And there are areas in our life that we have yet to give over to you or we gave them to you, but we're taking them back. That Lord, today you would give us the grace to lay them at your feet. Say, Lord, I I was never meant to carry this burden. It's too heavy for me. And maybe there's areas of unforgiveness or maybe there's just problems in your marriage or your finances or whatever it is. But Lord, I need you. I need your fingerprints all over these hopes and dreams, these fears and anxieties. I need you to work in ways that, Lord, that I can't. So, Lord, I just humbly ask you to to do this, to work out these things um, by your power, by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. Blessings as you go. We're going to have the altar team here. If you want someone to pray for you, if there's something in your heart that you say, yeah, I just need to give this over to God, and you want someone to agree with you, then we'll be here for that. But blessings on you. Enjoy your week. Stay safe.